Check's up again, down again career is perhaps best reflective of life on the street. Described in a Fortune magazine cover in 2002 as one of the last honest analysts on Wall Street, she was recruited by Citigroup that very year to manage its brokerage business, a move by the bank to repair its tainted reputation. Two years later, she was appointed CFO of what was then the world's biggest bank. Had Krocek pierced the glass ceiling or was she at the edge of a glass cliff? Now Krocek's rise was meteoric. Observers say for someone with her level of experience, managing a CFO position would have been difficult. And it was. It was the perfect glass cliff situation. In March 2007, Krocek was moved out of the CFO's office and sent back to Leeds City's Wealth Management Division, a very public demotion. What followed were disagreements with the new city CEO Vikram Pandit about protecting client money and her eventually divorcing City Group. And a tryst with the street didn't end there. Krocek was soon heading the global wealth management function at Bank of America. But two years later, it was deja vu. Management restructuring at the very top led to an inevitable demotion for Krocek. And like she had two years earlier, she walked. That does ring true and the numbers speak for themselves. According to a 2011 Catalyst census, even though women make up almost 40.5% of all employees in the securities, investment banking and commodities sector, they account for just 17.7% of managers. And at the chief executive level, they are even fewer than 3%. Now this number might just have dipped further earlier this year with Ina Drew's resignation, Ina Drew of JP Morgan, when the company actually lost $2 billion at the chief investment office while she was heading it. While some see these departures as actions of a boys club eliminating women, others believe that at least some of these dismissals are steps in the right direction. in India for women in the banking and financial services space seems to be a one of success beyond belief. Now compared to 7% women in top jobs in finance in Fortune 500 companies, the number in India stands at a whopping 54%. And in India, these numbers are way ahead of women's performance in any other sector or any other grouping. Let's just take a look at the numbers there. In India, in banking and finance, the number of women at 54%, FMCG only 8%, manufacturer than what we're seeing across the globe as well. So over this week and the next, we look at the journeys of women from the banking and financial services industry to understand why this space in India has seen so many women flourish. It's more like a last 20-25 year phenomenon and because it's a relatively new industry, maybe there were very few uh, stereotypical biases. If you look at India's economic growth in the last 10 years, it has been driven by the services sector and as women have entered the workforce in increasingly higher numbers over the last couple of decades, uh, you naturally see a lot of them flocking to these areas uh, because that's where the opportunities are for everybody. I think the support system is fabulous. You talk to any of the working women today at any levels, you can see that you know the support system in terms of parents, in-laws, etc. Just the domestic help you get is just very, uh, is far better than what you get in the US and Europe. We'll also explore each of their success stories to understand what career women can do to make it to the top. I was always ambitious, aggressive and obviously fiercely competitive. They have to take their work seriously and commit themselves to work and then the appropriate rewards will come in place over time. You know? Not to be so reticent, to be more outspoken, to, be, to show the desire to be part of the thought leadership and the decision making. Not to get, uh, you know, sort of boxed into uh, any particular file. Now we made the point earlier that women in the banking and financial services space in India 
far outnumber their counterparts in New York and one of the primary reasons for this is that the industry in India is fairly new. The current pack of women leaders who started their journeys in the mid-1980s had fewer legacy issues to deal with in comparison to their counterparts in the rest of the world. Consider this question on a test for a trainee program at Merrill Lynch in 1972. When you meet a woman, what interests you most about her? The correct answer was beauty. Low scores were given for those who answered intelligence. Melissa Fisher in her book Wall Street Women says this sort of institutionalized sexism in finance might not exist anymore for fear of expensive lawsuits. But she argues that a century-long tradition of actively keeping women out continues to define the work ethic on the street. In India, the story has been different. I do not know how many companies would encourage creation of entrepreneurship that I say say nurtured. We never got uh, hanged for our mistakes. Uh, it was perfectly well understood within the system that uh, if you get three things right, you might get two things wrong and that's perfectly okay. Renuka Ramnath has been dubbed the queen of private equity in India. She's been responsible for shaping the nascent PE market and making ICICI Venture Fund one of the largest in the country before she quit. An engineer by training, Ramnath, as a young MBA graduate, envisioned herself in a transformational role in the manufacturing industry. Manufacturing companies uh, did have uh, a glass ceiling. Financial services, on the other hand, uh, uh, where traditionally, even before we came in to join these institutions, had employed women and had given them an equal opportunity to grow within those organizations. So there was already an acceptance of uh, women as capable, uh, uh, capable resource who should be provided the same opportunity as men. In addition, the job itself brought a huge uh, dignity of uh, labor. So that made women very comfortable. So that became, therefore, uh, a reason why women who joined financial services remained there and grew uh, within their own organizations. Both my mother and my dad have always been working. To not have a career was never uh, a thought in my mind at all. I came into IIM with a lot of confidence. I did not know which uh, branch I would follow. I did try uh, a summer internship at marketing, hated it. And so it was very clear that I was going to do finance. Medika Bhandarkar too began her career with ICICI where she recalls being able to walk up to senior management to talk things through without being judged on gender. She says all the judging was strictly on merit. Whether it's the private sector Indian banks, whether it's the international banks, whether it's the brokerages, they've all developed relatively recently. It's more like a last 20, 25 year phenomenon. And because it's a relatively new industry, maybe there were very few uh, stereotypical biases. And because these organizations have had very meritocratic uh, cultures, maybe that's one of the reasons why women have uh, done so well in financial services in India. It's also true at other industries which are relatively new. So if you look at um, technology, you look at media, IT services, again all new industries in India and you'll see uh, the percentage of senior women is quite high. Time for a break on what women really want but on the other side we look at how work cultures in Indian banks and financial institutions have evolved since 1991 to be more accommodative of women. I moved with my husband to London, then US, where I set up offices for Kotak in both those places. The momentum for this first generation of working women, which are as, you know, very aspirationally aggressive and want to do more, is, is very good. You can say that, uh, you know, Indian markets grew and I was able to grow with the market.
common to all these women chief executives is that they belong to the private banking and financial services industry in India. Another common point is that a majority of them have spent at least some time at the great women CEO manufacturing company, ICICI Bank, where former group chairman Narayan Bagu maintained that recruitment and promotions were never a question of gender, they were looking for talent. By contrast, the Indian public sector has had a different trajectory. Tajrani Vakil was the first woman to get to the top job in a state-owned financial institution, the Exim Bank of India, in 1993. In its 43-year history, state-run banking industry has had three women chiefs. Ranjana Kumar of Indian Bank was appointed CEO in 2000, H. A. Daruwala of Central Bank was the second woman CEO, and Nupur Mitra of Dana Bank the third. State Bank of India, India's largest bank, has not had a single woman CEO in its 200-year-old history. SBI did appoint its first Deputy Managing Director in 2006, and now it does have a few more female Deputy MDs who might someday rise to the corner office. Now, is this a case of legacy issues at play where older institutions find it more difficult to change? That could be part of the reason. The other, according to a finance ministry appointed panel on human resources in state-run banks, finds that women's reluctance to transfer is the main reason for their inadequate representation in senior management. This, the report says, is not a big issue in tech-savvy private banks where the focus is on big cities. I realized that financial services at that stage was taking off and a number of financial services companies were growing very rapidly and uh, uh, you know uh, having specialized in finance at the institute I decided to then move on to financial services and that's when I joined Kotak in 1993. Since 1993 Falguni Nair has had a career trajectory very similar to most of her peers in the industry. Her job involved extensive travel, sometimes for her own work and sometimes transfers necessitated by her investment banker husband Sanjay Nair's job. Moved with my husband to London, then US, where I set up offices for Kotak in both those places. Uh, I had joined Kotak to head the M&A business, uh, but in the middle I started doing broking, institutional broking and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the capital market business. Uh, finally, I came back to India with Kotak and uh, gradually initially I was heading our institutional broking business but later got to head our investment banking also. So you can say that uh, you know Indian markets grew and I was able to grow with the market. So saw pretty much uh, the whole journey of investment banking uh, for India. Today Renuka Ramnath has taken the entrepreneurial plunge with multiple alternate asset management. But she benefited tremendously from her 25 year stint at ICICI Bank learning and growing as the firm diversified. The big haha -ha moment happened for the first time when we did the joint venture with JP Morgan which gave me the opportunity to go to New York and train uh, in the offices of JP Morgan. That was my very first exposure to global financial markets. And the second big turning point was when uh, ICSA gave me the opportunity to set up the structured finance group. Just conceptualizing the business, putting together the team, training the team, winning business and making profit. At the end of this journey, uh, ICSA again was uh, extremely generous to sponsor me at my request uh, to uh, the Harvard AMP. And when I came back after that uh, program, I, I would say that I definitely turned into an entrepreneur rather than uh, uh, just a good finance professional. Now this is actually one crucial differentiator between women bankers in India and those in London and New York. They have fewer resume gaps having at some stage of their careers dabbled in different verticals of the business because the businesses themselves were growing. Now this gave them suitable experience to handle matters of the corner office. Nonetheless, it has not been an easy cruise to the C-suite. What are some of the challenges that they face? That is on the other side of the break. Stay tuned. It didn't even matter whether I had the most value to add, but there were a few clients who would not talk. To. Aspirationally to be as good as our mums at home and just be fantastic homemakers, bake the best apple pie, and really it's not going to happen, you know, and learn to accept it, learn to outsource the apple pie and you'll be fine. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Odin's. Welcome back. You're watching What Women Really Want. Now, we might have a large number of women in top jobs in our banking and financial sector. And while there have been a large number of positive factors that have helped them get there, the journey hasn't been without its challenges. Sometimes uh, I would go for meetings and I would go with a few colleagues. It did not matter whether I was the senior most uh, person or it didn't even matter whether I had the most value to add. But there were a few clients who would not talk to me because uh, they felt they should talk only, uh, they should address their conversation only to my male colleagues. Uh, again, at that time I would get angry and uh, annoyed. Now I can laugh about it. But what I've realized over the years is if you have something valuable to say, if you have a contribution to make, very soon the person opposite you forgets what your gender is. And then he or she is just listening to you or responding to you because of what you have to say, not because of what your gender is. From childhood, we are trained that we must become the good wife, the good mom. And you know, that sort of, I think, we a lot of us bring to, our, to the work environment too. While the male doesn't carry any of that baggage, he comes in far more aggressively demanding, demanding for his rights. And I think that needs to change. I think we need to own our success. I think I used to see a huge resistance in terms of my male colleagues who would go into business schools and they would always prefer the male colleague and say, look, you know, if you get a woman three, four years later, she'll get married, she'll move locations, etc., etc. And, and I would really, uh, you know, argue back and say, look, uh, you know, if women get married, women get pregnant, men switch jobs faster. So, you know, don't, this is not the right uh, uh, benchmark on the basis of which you select the candidate. For Girotra, the turning point in her career was when her daughter was born, but not for the obvious reasons one associates with motherhood. The turning point for me was really the birth of my daughter. I think time away from your children really, you know, is precious to you as a working mom. And, you know, if I am going out there, leaving my two-year-old back at home, I know what it takes to get out and do that. And then I want to make sure that it's meaningful for me. I want to make sure that I'm, you know, uh, that, that when I go back to my daughter, I can justify that, look, when I went out there, I did something meaningful, something that was really important to me, something that was enriching for me, something that rewarded me. And that's why I went out there. And I think that really nine years ago was a turning point in my life. This meant taking on challenging assignments and travel and Girotra's advice to working mothers is to make the most of the support systems that Indian women enjoy. I speak to my colleagues in US and Europe, they just, they just find it very challenging to leave their children back at home. There is no support system unless you're happy to send your children to daycare, etc., which, you know, not everyone is comfortable with. Don't, don't be shy in asking for help. I think a working woman needs a lot of help from the social infrastructure, whether it's your parents, your in-laws, you know, the, 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 your staff at home. Just, just don't try and be superwoman. I think that's really what burns out women a lot because, you know, we're just taught aspirationally to be as good as our mums at home and just be fantastic homemakers, bake the best apple pie. And really, it's not going to happen, you know. And learn to accept it, learn to outsource the apple pie, and you'll be fine. It was hard initially. It was, it was awkward initially because, you know, especially uh, when we started off in India, the pie of banking was very small. So you inevitably tended to compete on, you know, the same very small pie of business. So initially it was awkward and, you know, we, 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 all, we both ran into each other at clients and, you know, didn't really take very well to it when we got there and we got back home in the evening. But I think now we've sort of, you know, both have been done this for 20 years, sort of grown up with each other, grown up doing this business. Our clients have grown up with us through it. So I think, I think now we found a nice balance through it all because my husband came from similar understanding maybe and uh, uh, you know he was very supportive at every point I mean it was always uh, I've always said that he has uh, advised me as a you know as a professional in terms of how I should uh, give prioritize my work vis-a-vis -vis the family situation so if the work demands it you know it was never uh, I don't think family ever came in the way of uh, what work needed admits that having a husband from a similar work background helped but ultimately it's up to the woman to take her work seriously if she wants to succeed. A lot of women don't dream big, they don't uh, want to take on more than what they can chew, they're very conscious of not taking on larger responsibilities. In fact, 
I feel they sometimes shirk away from larger responsibilities. They have to take their work seriously and commit themselves to work and then the appropriate rewards will come in place over time, you know. So this is what women can do for themselves. But what are organizations doing to create an even playing field for women? That's on our show next week. Till then, from the entire team, goodbye and many thanks for watching. If you ask me, is mentoring important? I think it is very important, particularly in today's day and time, when the choices are many, organizations are complex, jobs are complex and very intimate. A firm commitment to meritocracy and being very flexible uh, when women wanted it on a case-by-case -case basis. The change now is that we are trying to make it more formal.